I thank you for coming. And I, I know we have an impressive um, um, presentation for you today that I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, be enjoying and learning so much from today. And we're going to start today with a meditation that uh, is going to be presented by uh, Dr. Jennifer Drake. And she is a, first of all, a Caritas coach, which is important because this is a Caritas program. And uh, she is also in charge of onboarding new uh, residence nurses for the Inova Health System in Northern Virginia. So Jennifer, if you would gather us all together with your meditation, I'd appreciate it. And I'm sure we all will. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I am actually shifting a little bit. I decided to do a heart share to help us all ground and connect ourselves to this space together. Um, and so to bring us into our space together, uh, I'm going to start off by reading a poem. And then I'd like to hear in one or two words, I'm going to ask you a question afterwards, um, just to all bring us to the center here. So this is one of my most favorite poems, and we used it in a class uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I see Diane there, my partner uh, from our class, and uh, Diane Swangros. And uh, we, I saw you wave, Diane Reed, and I thought, oh, she thought of me. So my apologies. There's a lot of Dianes here today. Didn't have, catch that right away. Um, but we we used this uh, poem. Uh, in our class and I just loved it and it just called to me so I wanted to share it with all of you it's called the quiet power I walked backwards against time and that's where I caught the moon singing to me I steep I steep downward into my seat and that's where I caught freedom waiting for me like a lilac I ended thought and I ended story I stopped designing and arguing and sculpted a happy life. I didn't die, I didn't turn to dust. Instead, I chopped vegetables and I made a calm lake in me where the water was clear and sourced and still. And when the ones I loved came to it, I had something to give them and it offered them a soft road out of pain. I became beloved and I came to know that this was it, the quiet power. I could give something might lasting that stopped the wheels of chaos. By tending to the river inside, keeping the water rich and deep, keeping a bench for you to visit. So as we take a moment to let that sink in, I can put it in the chat if you'd like to read it. And my question for all of you is, what is your quiet power? What would you say is your quiet power? Think about that as we sit here together. And when you're ready, go ahead and unmute yourself or put it in chat so that we can hear what your quiet power is. I see Julie's quiet power is love. It's beautiful. Gratitude. Gratitude. Yes. Solitude. Solitude. Healer and compassion. Peace. Peace. I see connection and listening. Ah, to be the bench for those to gather on. Well, that's beautiful. That's lovely. Silence. Relationship. I, mm -hmm. I think my quiet power is the ability to be a soft place to land. Yes. I see presence. Roundedness. That's lovely. Laughter. Oh, one of my most favorite things. Groundedness, listening, comfort. 
All these words are so powerful, aren't they? Maybe we can just take a moment and take all these words in and embrace them in our quiet power. And I thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. Very nice. Very nice. Different, a different beginning. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, I, the next thing on the agenda is just a few comments from um, uh, Sh Cheryl Handy, uh, who is one of the original, uh, one of the uh, people that started uh, this, this meeting. And uh, Patty O'Rourke will follow Cheryl. So Cheryl, if you would. Oh, sure. You are. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, everyone. And I just want to thank each of you for your energetic presence here this morning. A very special thank you uh, to our special guest, Dr. Joseph Stern. And uh, Dr. Stern, I have to disclose, oftentimes there's a lot of uh, yin energy in this space. So I, I personally reached out to a colleague of mine who's a physician, some yang energy. So he's dry. He's driving to Florida, actually lost his uncle. So he's driving to Florida. So he's participating. So don't think you're the only yang energy in, in this space. But I want to take this time to acknowledge a very dear um, Caritas sister of ours, Marcy Newman. And I just want to thank her for, you know, her love and her grace and what she's brought. Um, it was Marcia, maybe five years ago, who really had the vision for Caritas Healing Connection. And this vision emerged after the untimely uh, death of a very dear friend that was very close to all of us and family, very active part of uh, Watson Caring um, Science Institute, as well as board of directors. And when we came together for a memorial of uh, service, for this special and dear friend, this, this vision and idea came to Mars and said, hey, this was such a healing environment. We have to maintain this space. And so the vision in why she matric matriculated through Caritas Coast Education Program, um, this vision for Caritas Healing Connection emerged. And it's been such a, a, a wonderful uh, experience of healing and wholeness and self-care for all of us. So Marcia, we're just from our a deep space in our heart. We just want to thank you. And the reason I'm saying this, because Marcy has recently shared with us that she needs to pause for a while to, you know, take care of herself and to refresh and renew. And these things are so important. And there's nothing as special as a time to embark upon this spiritual journey of renewal and self-care and self-healing is doing this Lenten season. So we're holding you up with lots of love and light and grace and know that your beautiful spirit and energy is always with us, Mar Marcy. We love you. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, it's been my honor, truly. And I am, uh, I'm so grateful to all of you. I really love all of you. Now, Patty now has a few words to share. Oh my gosh. And Mine is very short and sweet for my Caritas sister and my VA sister and my traveling nurse everywhere. When I want to say M is for um, being a mentor and being a motivator. And A is for being an acupuncturist. R is for being a registered nurse. C is be a, coast, a Caritas model. And then Y is saying yes to the service to not only the VA, to the family of all of us and also our country and our profession. And it's so appropriate that Dr. Stern is talking about grief because it is sad and happy that we have you and that we feel like we're losing you. But I love what Dr. Seuss said, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. And I love you, Marcy. Thank you, Patty. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just taking a pause. I, know. And I will be visiting too. Thank you. Uh, we we thank you, Marcy, and uh, I think your two acknowledgers. I think you did a beautiful job and uh, spoke for all of us. And uh, we'll go forward with the with the program then. 
Okay, Julie is going to introduce Dr. Stern. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Cheryl and Marcy and Jennifer for starting us off. I It's funny, I, I had a dream last night about what I, I think I must've been nervous about this morning, what to say to, about Dr. Stern, how to introduce him. And part of the dream was almost about how I think what was resonates with me is the title of, of Dr. Stern's book, which is entitled Grief Connects Us. So, you know, part of this offering to um, our community is not about how great we are, how academic we are, how important we are. Actually, the one thing that is important about our Caritas Healing Connections is that as that, is our humanness. So we connect as humans and part of that humanness connection is of course grief. Um, and it's very also very pertinent that we celebrate Marcy because she has recently experienced um, the, the death of her beloved husband um, fairly recently. So that's another um, moment just to, to honor and acknowledge that. We love you, Marcy. We always send so much love. So I'm just going to be brief because I want to make sure that Joseph Stern has time to share with us. But personally, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Stern in Italy. Um, we met in Lucca, Italy, um, um, at the invitation of Dr. Joseph Giovononi, who is another colleague of ours. And um, not only that, we had a very special kind of in, um, experiential uh, retreat session with our some of our caring science um, scholars, but then we moved to Florence, where Dr. Stern presented a beautiful um, presentation to the Italian um, and, and American nurses that were there. Um, which is why we just felt that you know when at the retreat, Dr. Stern said, "What is all of this all about?" You know, and then <laughs> towards the end, we were also we sort of realized that we are cut from the same cloth. And so it's really lovely to have Dr. Stern with us today. I just wanna read a, a brief update about uh, Dr. Stern and his journey at the moment. I know that in our marketing, we had um, some information, but I just wanted to share something that Dr. Stern sent to me. So he's starting a new position as a member of the faculty in the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Michigan on April 1st. He will be teaching residents, communication skills, serious illness conversations, managing complications, effective shared decision-making, establishing a program with the Department of Palliative Care, integrating palliative care and neuroscience in the neuro ICU, developing a program in surgical ergonomics to extend safety and career longevity, so this last point is also an equity issue. Since women are entering surgical fields, but we are all using tools designed in the 1950s that are one size fits all and based on male physical characteristics. I'm also running the, the first ever palliative care and neuroscience course at our national meeting in Chicago at the AANS in May. So we just want to say thank you for your wisdom, your vision, and for really contributing to the field of care. And with that, I hand over and introduce Dr. Joseph Stern. Thank you, Dr. Stern. Julie, Julie thank you a ton. And um, I'm going to pull up some slides. So uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm delighted to, that you invited me. Um, and what I'm talking about is kind of less about actual kind of grief and loss that I experienced and more about where we go with it um, and where, I, where I'm where i going with it, kind of both. Um, so I asked, what, what is a neurosurgeon doing here anyway? Um, you know, you guys are, I'm intimidated talking to a room full of nurses. I've gotten better at it, but initially it was pretty hard um, because I feel like I, I'm, I'm learning from you more than you're learning from me. Um, but I think we're united with shared journeys. We've all had grief and loss. We've all experienced suffering. Uh, we need to develop compassion and support for ourselves and for each other. 
and we need to change the cultures of dysfunctional um, organizations that we find ourselves in. So there, there's a lot that brings us together. So we have a shared vision and passion to go from isolation to connection, from injury to healing, and to create a community of care and compassion. And I've decided what I want to do is to be the change that I want to see. So this comes out of grief. So I'll talk a little bit about my journey and then some of the things I've been doing. Who am I? What have I learned? How have I changed? And what's next? And then maybe some take-home messages. So who am I? So I trained at the University of Michigan. So this is kind of a homecoming for me. I'm going back to where I trained. I've been in practice for almost 30 years in the largest neurosurgical group practice in America called uh, uh, Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine Associates. I've been in Greensboro, North Carolina. I, you know, it's funny, I wanted to be a writer and when I first, I was an undergrad and I told, uh, we took a creative writing class um, as a freshman and I, the teacher said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a writer. And he said, well, you have nothing to say. You, you've not lived any, go live. And then maybe you'll have something to write about. And I was a little offended at the time, but I realized actually that was probably some of the best advice I ever got. Um, based on my sister's illness and kind of my experiences, I've written articles that have appeared in New York Times and Washington Post, World Neurosurgery, Journal of Palliative Medicine, and I wrote the book. Um, and I've been teaching UNC medical students initially as adjunct faculty, and now I'm actually gonna be joining the faculty um, at Michigan. So I wrote this book, and this book came out of my sister's illness and untimely death. This is a picture of uh, my sister Victoria and our mother and uh, me as kids uh, growing up in Washington, DC. And later we lived in London, England for four years. And this was her and me and our dog, Daisy, walking down uh, the street. We separated as we grew up and she went off to uh, California, married Pat, uh, became a, an actress and a mother of two sons. I got married to Catherine, moved to uh, North Carolina and went into neurosurgical practice. And we sort of drifted apart. Well, that rapidly changed in uh, 2014 when my sister developed a flu-like illness. And this is a excerpt from her journal of basically the flu-like illness to turn, turned into acute myeloid leukemia and necessitated a bone marrow transplant for which her son, Nick, was the donor. And this is a piece of her journal. And one of the things I was saying earlier before this started was one of the things I'm most proud about in, our, in my book is that I was able to uh, weave my sister's journal into the book. Um, she initially wrote about her illness because she said she wanted to uh, have a one woman show about surviving leukemia. And in actual fact, it became a journal of her demise. Um, but here she talks about how she was in the hospital for almost eight months, uh, kind of sealed away, taken out of her normal life, uh, removed from contact with people and friends. She's a very, very giving, caring, um, energetic, uh, social person. So that would have been very hard for her. Here she was in the hospital. This was at City of Hope in uh, outside of LA. And you can see that she had her head shaved because she tired of her hair falling out all the time. You know, one of the things she tried to do was to humanize her environment. And she put pictures of her family all over her room. But here she was sitting in her bed and she was connected to her IV pole, which she referred to as her stalker. Uh, she had 12 IV pumps constantly fixed to her. So one of the things that I realized was you know, I saw my sister as a patient, which is how we see almost everybody in the hospital. You know, she's she's lost her clothing. She's lost her hair. She's in a gown. Uh, she doesn't seem like she's connected to her history and to her, her story. Yet few people knew that just a few months earlier, she was a vital, engaged actress, a mother of two, wife, full of life, full of activity. And almost no one saw the little girl that I had grown up with and didn't know or appreciate her story. But it turns out that this is everyone. This is everyone that we take care of in hospitals and healthcare. They all have histories. They all have stories. They all are not gowned um, people who've lost their dignity. 
And this led to a personal transformation. It was as if I went from seeing in black and white to suddenly seeing in color. So a year and a half after my sister died, her husband, Pat, had a ruptured aneurysm in his brain and went into a coma. And his son, uh, Nick, the one who had donated his bone marrow for his mother, did CPR on his father. And I was his healthcare power of attorney, which meant I had to make decisions about whether to have surgery and whether to withdraw treatment. And I found this to be an excruciating position to be in um, and saw kind of, again, what it was like to be on the receiving end of healthcare and how with all my training, it still didn't protect me from the intense experience, intense emotions I experienced. Here's a picture of the family. This is um, Pat, um, Victoria, Nick, and Will. So what have I learned? I learned that emotional armor, which I put in place to somehow protect me from grief, didn't work. And in fact, was a detractor and I wanted to get rid of it. And I think I have gotten rid of it. I learned that you need to put something in place and in its place. And that's emotional agility. That healthcare really is founded or must be founded on empathy and compassion. And I've learned a lot about burnout in the process. In terms of emotional armor, you know, it's a it's an effort to protect ourselves from grief and from pain, um, but it doesn't work. And one of the biggest real things I saw was that not only does it protect me, not protect me from feeling grief, but it also diminishes the richness of my experience and takes away the highs as well. So I just realized it was something I needed to get rid of. Brene Brown in her TED Talk talked about the power of vulnerability. And in her talk, she said, well, surgeons and pilots get a pass. They don't really need to be vulnerable. And I realized, well, as a surgeon, I actually do need to be vulnerable. I need to connect with my patients and I need to have compassionate and empathetic and emotionally uh, connected relationships with them. But I also need to learn how to flex between uh, being connected and also being uh, on the game in terms of doing surgery and being uh, not emotionally um, op entirely open at that point. And this requires something called emotional agility, which allows a range of conflicting emotions. We're not taught any of these things in medical school. We're not taught how to, how to function uh, with agility and with connection and with compassion. And these are things that we learn or don't learn on our own and often don't learn well. So emotional agility is a better option. And one of the core things about this is that life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. You know, you can't separate them out. You can't, that's that's what makes uh, life and being a human so special and also so uh, uh, complicated. And emotional agility requires self-compassion. I think a lot of times neurosurgeons in particular were pretty um, precision and driven, precise and driven and oftentimes perfectionistic and so we don't do really well when we screw up or when we fail or when we um, don't get the result we're hoping for. And so one of the cornerstones of self-compassion is forgiveness. And I think that's one of the things that we need to develop more of. A lot of people say they don't have time to connect with a patient emotionally. And this isn't just uh, neurosurgeons, but kind of all physicians. And it really only takes 17 seconds to develop an empathetic relationship with a patient. And really what it takes is a willingness to go there. Do we have time? Yes. Do we have the inclination? Well, a lot of times we want to avoid that connection and you know rush from one task to the next and um, focus instead on, on the mechanics of all the work we have to do rather than taking the time to really connect on a meaningful way with patients. It turns out that empathy and agility can both be taught. And Dr. Helen Rice has been really important to me. Um, she's a professor of um, psychiatry at Harvard and wrote something called The Empathy Effect. And she's created a company called Empathetics, which has validated measures that show that empathy and agility can be taught, even to surgeons who are some of your different, most difficult audience. Um, and so I think that's really important that we we aren't, you know, some people will say, oh, you, you have empathy or you don't. Uh, well, some have more and some have less, but everyone can gain and everyone can learn. 
So compassion or to suffer with we, is really the, that we see suffering and we try to relieve it. And it's it heals. It has a tremendous impact on patients and on patient care. It's what we remember as patients. And a lack of compassion causes harm and causes us uh, suffering. So compassion must drive patient care and must drive our health systems. I talked to um, the CEO of our health system and I said, you need to not worry about your HCAP scores. You need to just worry about really having a compassionate organization and you'll find the results will blow everybody away. But I think people are afraid and also obsessed with the kind of financial um, path of institutions and compassion tends to get squeezed out. And treatments can become distractions. This was very important in terms of my sister. Her initial diagnosis was what's called monosomy seven. And what that means is that had a 6% five-year survival rate for her kind of leukemia. So she was almost, uh, she was most likely to die um, when she was diagnosed. That was pretty clear. But she never wanted to accept that. She believed that allowing that into her reality would make it her reality. And so she would never really accept that she might die. And uh, this became a problem because she never said goodbye. She never accepted that she was going to die and never said goodbye to her husband and to her children. And this was particularly the case uh, after she her platelet count dropped and her um, transplant was clearly not working. But instead of kind of having a really hard conversation with her, uh, her doctors basically substituted another form of chemotherapy and it didn't work and they knew it wasn't gonna work. So let's talk a little bit about burnout. Over half of doctors are exhausted, alienated, and feel ineffective. And often I thought, well, maybe it's the um, intense emotions, but I've, as I've come to accept and allow them more into my life, I realized that probably, at least for me, some of burnout was defending against them rather than the intensity of the emotions themselves. And burnout is the normal response to unmitigated workplace stress. We're like the canaries in the coal mine. And a lot of health systems say, well, we just need more resilient canaries and make them tougher, rather than looking and saying, well, what we really need to do is to reshape the workplace and not the worker. And uh, Dr. Christina Maslach and uh, Leiter wrote a book called Burnout Challenge, which was great, and talks about how we can really improve our workplaces. And the whole idea of self-care and add-ons as uh, kind of compassion fixes that basically we're going to keep the workplace the way it is, but we want you to do yoga doesn't work. Yet, compa yet self-compassion is a key and foundational part of it, but it has to be built in and not just added on at the end. So it's not easy to prevent burnout. I think some things that can help us are emotional connection and learning to navigate health systems a sense of growth and purpose and overwork can also lead to injury. And I'm going to circle back to that in a minute. So what did I do personally, you know, going through this experience with my sister and her husband and then writing a book? Um, well, I've taken training in palliative care. I've been working in international medicine with an organization called One World Surgery. And I've begun to teach both at UNC uh, with medical students in Greensboro. I taught a medical humanities class. I've also been a facilitator for the Healing Arts, which is a national program. Uh, and then I'm now starting to teach in the residency program at Michigan. And part of this was a sense of frustration that I was trying to get change on a local level in my health system and nothing was changing. And I realized I probably needed to go upstream and start to work with people who are more open uh, and more malleable if I was going to see any change. So how have I changed? I think I've opened my mind and my heart. I talked about the palliative care, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I had an injury while working, and I'm going to talk about that, and teaching in the faculty position. So one of the things I advocated for in my book was uh, the need for palliative care. When, I, when Pat was in the ICU, basically palliative care was an afterthought, and it was as if you know they decided, well, he's not going to live, so now we're going to bring in palliative care. And that's going to talk about essentially funeral planning. And I thought that was a real missed opportunity. So I wanted to learn more about palliative care and as an advocate of it. 
and I took a course on palliative care education and practice through Harvard Medical School, um, which was remote due to COVID and had two, long, uh, two week long sessions with a project with lectures in small groups. And we developed communication and listening skills and skills maps. Uh, we explored the importance of teamwork. We role played with professional actors and we had a safe space to learn and to grow. So one of the things I did was try to create a new program in my health system, integrating palliative care into the clinical services with palliative care in the neuro ICU. And I did this with Marlene Golden, who's on the, on the, this, um, it was present today. We tried to really change the culture and the structure of our organization. And essentially we hit a wall. Now, one of the things that kind of brought us together was uh, the CEO and I'll just, uh, um, Mary J. Jo Cagle of our health system, herself had experienced care, which was lacking in compassion. She's an OBGYN and her mother had a subdural hematoma and was basically dying in Alabama at the University of Alabama. And so she, this is a little clip of a video I made where she talks about what it's like to be on the receiving end of healthcare and how it can be pretty scarring and pretty awful. And I'll just share that with you for a minute that the neurosurgeons, the critical care docs, they were incapable of dealing with this end of life issue and allowing us to meet my mom's wishes. And I very much felt like um, that to meet that, it was in my hands to do it. And it was one of the most frustrating moments that I've ever experienced as a patient family member, as a physician, I was so frustrated and could not believe, this is the institution where I trained. And I felt that I was dismissed and I couldn't even get people to look me in the eye and have a conversation with me over something that was not unreasonable. You know, we talk a lot about making sure patients have advanced directives and living wills. My mother had all of that. It was brought to them early. They said, make certain palliative cares involved. We had palliative care involved prior to her surgery. We had a plan and yet none of that could be executed. So it's more than that. It, it is that all of our physicians have to have some training and some sensitivity to what it looks like to be involved with end of life care and understanding what patients and family members need. So, as I said, I've been working on developing new programs. When I hit a wall, at, um, at Cone, uh, where I work, I basically um, have shifted to uh, Michigan, where they seem much more interested. Hang on a second. Yeah. This led to um, an article I had in Journal of Palliative Medicine about why should a neurosurgeon attend a palliative care conference. And it's interesting because for a moment after I became injured, I thought, well, maybe I should go into palliative care. And then I realized, no, I kind of need to stick around in neurosurgery and try to make the culture better from where I am. So there's bifurcated care where there's a division between the technical and the emotional. And yet when we go through these experiences ourselves, yeah, the technical is important and you want to nail that. That needs to be something you, you don't have to worry about. But what matters most is that emotional support. That's what people take home. And so I wanted to bring that to the acute care setting, um, which has unique requirements and where teamwork is the key. Uh, with earlier involvement and frequent touches, consistent messaging and training. So one of the things I've done before the Michigan opportunity developed was I formed a collaboration with residents in neurosurgery at other institutions to develop palliative care programs because they're interested in developing them. And we've started to have some traction with this. And one of the things we are doing is trying to improve communication in neurosurgery which increases resilience and decreases ethical distress. There's a lot of that uh, communication training within palliative care. And so it's not like we need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to bring in the resources that are already there in other areas. And these include serious illness conversations, goals of care, shared decision-making, symptom management, 
uh, including opioid use and pain management, adverse operative events and chronic conditions. So one of the things that's neat is I'm doing this course in at um, in Chicago at the American Association of Neurological Surgeons on the evolution of palliative care and its relevance in neurosurgical practice. And this is the first time that neurosurgery has welcomed the palliative care perspective. And so we're going to do communication training and talk about how that needs to be integrated, creating the model and getting people to think about things differently. So why do we need palliative care in neurosurgery and the importance of teamwork? One of the organizers is from Australia, so they're going to talk about how palliative care is done differently and oftentimes better in places outside of the U.S. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about my experience in international medicine. And this is an organization called One World Surgery, which is predicated on service, healing, and transformation. I guess my point is that Really, there are these communities, you know, and there are people with similar interests and tapping into them and teaming up with them is a source of power and change. So currently in the world, 5 billion people lack access to surgical care. Paul Farmer said surgery is the neglected stepchild of global public health. Throughout the world, there are lower and middle income um, countries which have virtually no surgical care offerings. There's an organization called the uh, NPH, which is an orphanage, Nuestros Pequeños Hermanos, which is outside Tegucigalpa in Honduras. And this was the original hospital there, which was basically a shipping container that had been converted to a, a, a ba basically a Band-Aid station with very simple uh, surgical procedures offered there. So Peter and Lulu Daly, uh, Lulu is a, uh, is a pediatric nurse and Peter Daly is an orthopedic surgeon. They went down there to visit, and this girl named Angela had really a, a difficult leg deformity, and Reinhard Kohler is the guy who runs the place, and he has this habit of saying, well, what can you do to help uh, Angela? So he said, he said, can you fix Angela's legs in the shipping container? It's like, no, we can't do that. So they took her back to Minnesota, <laughs> and over the course of a year, they fixed her legs. And NPH has a policy of no adoption. So she went back. But when they went back, they created on the right, you can see this is a uh, aerial view of a ho surgical hospital that they fundraised, developed, and created. And then on the left, this is the um, uh, conference center. They're teaching anesthesia and teaching nursing and doing all kinds of things to um, elevate the care that's being provided in Honduras. Uh, and we're doing the same thing in uh, the Dominican Republic. There's an organization called uh, Bate, uh, uh, communities called Bates, which are basically stateless uh, Haitian refugees. And so we're providing surgical care and treatment for those free. So this is an example of the kind of things that we're able to do. This is a man who basically had an injury that was um, disabling. The guy on the right, his name is Merlin Antunes, and he is a, he was an orphan at the orphanage. He grew up and went to medical school, then became an orthopedic surgeon, now runs the center and provide is providing care. So it's kind of an inspiring story. And I feel great uh, when I'm down there and being involved. This is Angela, this is me. And these are statistics from 2021, but basically at this point, we have done 80,000 consults and over 8,000 free surgeries and have really started to make a difference in people's lives. It's also not a fly-in, fly-out organization. There are 50 permanent Honduran staff members. This is one of the spine groups that I've gone on, and I've gone on about eight trips doing this. And this is just a, a brief thing about a, a picture of a patient that I took care of. She had an old, this is called a Lukey rectangle, which is an old, you know, it's the lumbar spine image and shows she's got a, what's called a spondylolisthesis. And this is an old rectangle with wires that was put in in Mexico many years earlier. And then we revised that and extended her surgery. And this is the woman two hours after her surgery. This is during COVID, so we were still masked. So she went home two hours after her surgery with Tylenol and Advil and a big smile on her face. And it's just amazing to be able to participate in the care of these patients. This is another man named Marlon uh, Ramirez, who was 35 years old and was hit in a car accident, broke his femur 
and his uh, lower leg and had an external fixator was placed at an outside hospital and then was told you need to pay $500 to have hardware put in your leg or you won't, you won't have surgery, which would essentially have been a death sentence. So he found out about us, came to um, our organization and we put in a rod in his femur and plates and screws in his legs. And he walked out the next morning and has been um, functional and back to work and he's gotten a new lease on life. Um, so as a neurosurgeon, I want to talk about what's happened in my life. So I, as I said, I trained in, and at Michigan was in a busy practice uh, and uh, was doing a lot of surgery. And then I went from being a surgeon to suddenly being a patient. I had a three-year history of progressive elbow pain, which became basically incapacitating last year. I had to cut back on cases and came out of work for a month and nothing really helped. I had injections and therapy and ended up having my own surgery with an ulnar nerve release and then repair of my joints. And over time, I have uh, improved and uh, I'm basically out of severe pain, but I haven't gone back to doing surgery. I wrote an article that appeared in JAMA about this. It's entitled, It's Like a Death. And so, a section that says, I can dwell on my loss or continue to appreciate what I can still do, reveling in and exploring the capabilities I maintain rather than mourning those I've lost. So this is another part of grief. This was not a death. This was my losing my career. It turns out this story is far from unique and that surgeons, 80% of surgeons have work-related injuries. The focus is all on the patient and there's little regard for proper, proper posture or spinal stability. And the symptoms are often ignored or not reported. It turns out that I was a setup for injury. I wore loops, which are magnifying lenses and a heavy headlight, which puts you in a flexed position. I wore a lead apron all the time, which also put me in poor position. And I had a busy surgical schedule with repetitive application of large magnitude forces. And I wasn't standing properly. I wasn't using ergonomic equipment or design. And guess what? I got injured. So I stopped working as a surgeon, but now, and that was a tough year because it was a lot of identity. My identity was wrapped up in being a surgeon. Um, but now I kind of feel like I've developed a new, uh, a second wind or a wind at my back maybe because I've, I went to Michigan as a visiting professor and talked about these things about a need for palliative care and ergonomics and surgery. And one of the women uh, surgeons in the audience said, raised her hand and said, these tools are uncomfortable and painful for me to use, and I've never complained about them, but there's never a day where I'm not in pain. And it's kind of like, well, we're, we're all together on this. So the, the chairman, Dr. Pandy said, I want you to come and teach and work on these projects here. I want to give you the platform to make a change, which is great. So I'm excited about that. So what are my take home messages? Well, James Doty is a friend and he's a neurosurgeon. He wrote uh, Into the Magic Shop and he has uh, something called the alphabet of the heart, which I think are some guiding principles I tend to, I try to live by of basically compassion, dignity, equanimity, forgiveness, gratitude, humility, integrity, justice, kindness, and love. And what was interesting when I was uh, listening to that poem and the response was a lot of these words came up. Um, I am now the proud owner of a, a, a Caritas or Watson Caring Science uh, singing bowl, which uh, so I'm gonna, which I use in the in my um, course, uh, the healing arts. Um, also the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So what to take to heart? We can't eliminate suffering. We can align with like-minded people and we can support and value each other and begin to change cultures. And this all comes from my learning from my sister and how she faced her illness and also my grief at her death. And so it's changed me and made me into a better person. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then let's chat thank you so so very much um dr stern you're speaking our language so it's very it's very interesting that the points that you bring up about really 
transforming, I think one thing that we align with is really transforming the current model of healthcare from sort of the inside out. So rather than moving away from those challenging sections or sectors like neurosurgery, where there's very little understanding of this to sort of stand, to stay, stay within that, um, your position, and then, you know, share your knowledge to your colleagues in this way. Um, and I think that, you know, here at Watson Caring Science Institute, we are, you know, a professional practice, um, educational nonprofit. And part of the theory of my mother's work is all about um, the 10 Caritas processes, which are basically the the, the 10 commandments of nursing or the you know 12 step program that you can use as tools as you go about your your work and and part of that I think you speak about is really about self so knowing self in order to then be compassionate to your colleagues and compassionate to your patients and compassionate to the community and the wider world um, and and I, I think it was really um, beautiful that you added from Dr. Doty's work, which I love his book as well. The the you you put in the the screen love, you know love with in red, and I think it's really important in our you know our the medical world in which we reside that love is not forgotten and that love is proudly. Um, not an add-on, as you say, to our work, but it is inherent in the work that we we do, we all do, um, whether that's caring for self, caring for our patients, or caring for our families, our fur babies, and our the strength the the people that we don't don't yet know. So thank you so very much, and and really, um, please, I'll, I'll open up the the Zoom for any comments, questions. Don't be shy. Oh, I see Wendy has her hand up. Um, Dr. Stern, I'm, I'm a physician as well in the ER at the VA. I work with Marcy, who invited me here to attend, and this was lovely, and I so appreciated it, and I, I so love this idea of being able to flex between the connectedness and then and this kind of usual wall of, you know, clinicalness that we typically do, and that's basically all we've been taught our entire career. Um, I, I know that you know, like I'm interested in it and I know that everybody in my group would, you know, definitely benefit from it. But I know that some of them might be like, oh, this is a little woo woo or that kind of thing. Like, I'm wondering what would be a good first step in trying to, I guess, bring them to this idea or like, you know, what, you know, small thing could I do that could improve all of our, you know, interactions with patients, you know, like, I know a lot of them are not going to want to sit down for an eight hour training or blah, blah, blah. Like, what could I do? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I was really, first of all, I'm very grateful to you for that comment and, and question. And I, uh, for, and I'll also tell you, I don't really know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's a real problem because one of the things I naively thought was, oh, if I write a book, you know, then things will just change. And what you find, you know, is that you do, you make all these efforts and, you don't often see change and then change comes in weird ways that you don't expect, you know, and like when I look at that tide of care integration part, you know, I thought that was dead and going nowhere. And now the, the head of the department and I are kind of designing a program. And, and so I feel like if I, if I move to an educational organization where I'm training people who are going to be the voice and thinking for the future, that's, that probably can result in change. Now, I'm sure I'm going to experience bureaucracy and slowness and all the other things that come with that. But um, I think that um, it's funny because when you have one of these courses, the people who show up are the people who don't really need it, right? And the other people who don't who don't show up are the ones you want to get to. But I think the only way you can make a change is by kind of the all boats, all boats rise, is that you show how to do it better or differently. Um, for neurosurgeons in particular, I think, they're very competitive. And um, so they will respond if they say, well, this guy's doing, what's he doing differently? But I think that's an inherent problem is so much kind of um, inertia and entrenchment and unwillingness to kind of think differently. And so I think that's a real, that's a real uh, challenge. I guess ultimately I've decided I can't, 
I cannot measure my success based on whether I am changing culture. I can be measure my success on whether I am being true to myself and to my goals and values. And if people buy into it, then great. And if people don't, then, you know, I'm, I'm dying trying, you know, and, and I feel like that. But the other thing is that, is I find that when, um, well, when Alexei Navalny just died and he said, you know, what's the, what's the take home message? And he said, uh, we are stronger than we think. Okay. We are, we can commit, we must commit and we must be, um, raise our voice. And I think, I think that, so I'm very, I'm very aware of that. I think that the, the community of compassion is much stronger than people realize and our um, power is greater than people realize. And one of the things I think is a real problem is our siloed nature, you know, that we're the nurses, I'm talking to nurses, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon, you know, it's like, why are we all so siloed? Why are we, why are we all so split up? But when I come and I talk to uh, someone who understands compassion, I don't have to tell them what it is or why it is or why it's important because you already know. And so we have a common language. We just need to start using it. And I also think we need to start making demands on um, health systems to say, no, this isn't working and it's not going to work. And why is it in when you're looking and you're saying, okay, well, I'm burned out is my choice to leave and just quit and, you know, walk away or to change things. I mean, it's a real, it's a real predicament, but I think that uh, engage, I can't, I couldn't walk away, you know, after I um, got out of doing surgery, I felt very uh, like I'd lost something and I wanted to stay there. Um, some people would say, oh, you know, you, you got your golden ticket off you go, you know, have, you know, golf. It's like, I don't want to do that at all. You know, so I, I think that um, we are stronger than we think we can make a bigger impact than we believe. And uh, our colleagues, our colleagues are listening more than we think. And also, um, I think that when you look at the dysfunctional behavior of like, you know, the the um, material, you know, there's a long list, you, you, we all know it. I think people, there is a general level of dissatisfaction. So I think that people need a, an understanding of a way forward and we can provide that. And I think that it, it will um, have resonance because it does matter and it, and it is true. So I, I don't know that I answered your question. I talked a lot, but I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. Well, something that um, the, that you said, or, or maybe it was the, the uh, Julie said about knowing yourself in order to become passionate. I was wondering if that maybe that's like a, a good place to like start with them. Like, you know, we've all lost a lot these past couple of years. Like it was, it was not great before, but like the past few years have been horrible for emergency medicine. And like, maybe like, getting them to talk about that. And I don't know, I, 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 like, I have this idea of, you know, like having this conversation, but I feel like so many of them be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to talk well, about emotions. <laughs> so let me just, let me just tell you, like in the, yeah. in the palliative care integration part, the way I'm selling it is like, it's not an add on to the neurosurgeons to say, okay, now you got to, you know, have touchy feely conversations with patients and families. It's more, we are going to support you and we're going to function as a team and we're going to offload some of the responsibilities, but we're going to provide more consistent communication and support for everyone, including you. You mm -hmm. know, there's this thing, there's this thing called team stretch, which is uh, from Mayo Clinic and from Michigan of in the operating room, if you do any any surgery greater than two hours in length, you take every 20 minutes, you do one minute of stretching the entire team. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it doesn't lengthen the surgery time. It, it decreases um, practitioner pain by 70%. And, you know, the doctors, the surgeons have pain levels when they self-report, you know, kind of survey, they say four out of 10, they're frequently in pain. And uh, with neck pain or back pain or arm pain or whatever, and then, but if you talk to the, the scrub techs and the nurses, their pain reports are like six out of 10. And so I look and I go, we've got to start creating programs and using programs where we can support each other. And a lot of these programs exist, you know, by doing the communication training, um, I think people are going to learn how to, how to speak about important issues with patients, but also how to find support for themselves. Because it's hard when you feel mm -hmm. like you're inventing the wheel every time. Thank you. And, yes. and um, 
there, there's quite a few resources on our website. Like we offer a free caring science mindful practice course. It's a one month course and it's all about what Dr. Stern is talking about, which might be useful. But I'll hand over now to um, Carol Bergen and then Marcy has her hand up and then Cheryl has her hand up. Thank you. You're muted, I think. Carol, you're... Mar Marcy, please, please say what you I'll, I'll hold. I wish I could speak for an hour, but I can't. For, <laughs> first, I want to say, Wendy, thank you for coming. Um, Wendy didn't mention, and I invited her, and she actually contacted me first to be on my subcommittee for employee whole health, which is underneath the umbrella of whole health in the VA. And Dr. Stern, I don't know if you know about the whole health program. We really are doing some remarkable feats in the biggest healthcare system in our country. And I am the employee whole health coordinator. And while I bring self-care moments, there are so many things that Wendy and I, I think we could work our magic together. And I do feel that docs and nurses have to do this together. And I also uh, want to st uh, really stretch and get the VA that we work at is in Wilmington, Delaware, for them to approve mandatory self-care time each day. There are some VAs that are doing that. And I do all kinds of trainings and everything, but there's so many things to do in this area. I love how you speak and I love how we're working together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Cheryl? Uh, thanks again, Dr. Stern, for that enlightening presentation. I just want to piggyback on both Wendy and Marcy and uh, also highlight a comment that uh, stood out for me under the section in your presentation on burnout, where it says self-care and add-ons don't work. So uh, sometimes I can, in my space of loving kindness, I can be a radical disruptor uh, because uh, my perspective is, is that it does work. And what in this, in a, of the framework of caring science and the evolved Caritas consciousness and expanded consciousness, we recognize and we know that to engage in this work in healthcare, self-care has to be a requirement. But traditionally, we think of self-care as meditation, yoga, you know, Tai Chi, you know, I'm engaged in all of that. And it is very helpful. But at a much deeper level, what we're talking about is some of the things that you've talked about is the repatterning of our consciousness. You know, self-care is a part of knowing when to surrender, knowing when to uh, forgive, uh, to let go. And most importantly, that compassion and human services, all of those things are extremely important. So, you know, we're not talking at that level of what am I doing? The the the, the area of self-care that we talk about and what we um, radiate and emphasize is how do I be? How do I be? How is my presence in that moment with another? And to highlight one other point, um, in this evolved consciousness, I just want to share from a, a, a different lens, not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, where I've had many of friends and even family members talk about in the death of a loved one, how they did not uh, say goodbye, they did not want to let go. But in this model of an expanded consciousness, we see things from a different worldview, where we understand that sacred cycle, where we have birth, we have life, and we have death. And there are sentient beings that presented this universe, and I do believe your sister was one of them, where she did not look at her death as an ending or destination, but as a transition. You know, and we, we've heard this story before because Dr. Watson, our leader in Caring Science, talked about it, how there was an elder when she talked about a, a significant loss she had experienced. And this uh, Native American elder said that we come here from the spirit world to fulfill our soul's purpose. And once our soul's purpose has been fulfilled, we transition back to spirit. So on a deeper level, your sister is not that she was being selfish and insensitive to what was going on with her family, but she knew that this temporary body, which our spirits are housed, that she was going to a, a, a different space. And at some point, you all would join her in spirit. So it's just an evolved way of looking at it. There's no right or wrong way, but just wanted to highlight that. So thank you for what you brought to us today. Thank you, 
Well, thank and thank you, Cheryl. I, I want to I appreciate what you just said, and I but I want to um go I want to go back to the the uh, bit about self care, which is that I I'm totally an advocate of self care, and I think it's super important. What I what I think is a problem is when organizations um, use self care as a it's they kind of weaponize it, where they say you know basically it's up to you to take care of yourself to um change you know to grow and do your yoga and your meditation and we're not going to change or even evaluate or look at what we're doing to contribute to the problem so i i am completely an advocate of self care i i i think from an organizational standpoint it's an easy out for them to say you know you got to do um you know you can do your 20 hours of work and and charting at home in the evenings and then we're going to do a poetry kind of reading at some point. You know that doesn't work. That's that's the part that doesn't work. It's not it's not um, the self care. I think the self care is vital, um, and I think a sincere effort to really have that be a fundamental part of what we do. I think would be would go a long way to helping people. Well, trust me, I certainly understand what you're saying. I recently retired after 40 years of services with the VA healthcare system. I retired from the Atlanta VA. So I, I know what it, it looks like to work in a bureaucratic and oftentimes biocidic culture, but it is in, it's important that you foster this and cultivate self-care practices for yourself sure. because sure. cultures, organizational cultures, they're not there yet. As we progress to these different eras, they're still stuck in that industrial mechanical right. curative effect. So, and it's really not their fault as to how they've been programmed. So we well, all- but, the, the, but, they, but they, at the same time, they are us, right? Because any organization is only comprised of individuals and therefore, you know, they, I don't think you give them an out by saying, well, you, you're, it's okay that you have an industrial mindset and, you know, it's all about productivity. It's like, well, you're not really, they're not, they need to evolve more because they cause they harm. Yeah, we don't give them an out, but we continue to hold that space of compassion for them as well as they evolve in their, at their own pace and in their own space. So thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so Carol, is it okay if I move on to Natalia or do you want Please, to- Please, I'll, I'll go last. I want to okay. hear what they- Okay, Natalia, thank you for raising your, your little hand there. <laughs> I, um, Julie, first of all, I want to say thank you for mentioning the 10 commandments because yeah. yes, like a couple of days ago, I all of a sudden, I was preparing a presentation about caring science and I realized, oh, this is 10 commandments. And I, and I thought, would Dr. Watson be mad at me if I said it's 10 commandments and you just said it and, and I was about it. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I do think that the caring, the caritas processes are 10 commandments. They give us direction uh, which way we go as nurse in nursing in uh, our da daily lives. Uh, I am a PhD student. I'm working on my dissertation and uh, I'm writing, I'm researching um, self-compassion and self-care, which is right at the topic. And uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Stern, uh, because he mentioned about the self-care practices in the workplace this is my scope of interest because i want to know what self-care practices are possible in the workplace for healthcare workers and um he, he mentioned one minute stretch during surgeries which is in the physical domain of self-care practices so and there are many other different domain relational um spiritual and uh, and so forth so i was wondering if we could if we could mention any other domains um self care practices that could be practiced in the workplace thank you yeah so i, I thanks thanks a lot i appreciate you doing that work cuz i think it's super important i mean i guess just taking off on what we talked about moments ago it's, um i believe that um community Forming community, I think there's a tremendous amount of, of a sense of isolation of practitioners that are basically working alone. They feel alone. They feel unsupported. Um, and so I think that um, the thing I like about that stretch um, routine is it acknowledges the pain and suffering across the entire operating room, not just, not just the surgeons, and brings them together with a point of reference that they're all having similar experiences and that there's a path to um, improvement. And I think you can make the same argument for, you know, how, how 
service lines function and how um, people report to, you know, through an organizational culture and that the self-care can, I think, I think um, positive self-care would be ones that um, build on that sense of community and uh, connectedness and breaking down silos and people recognizing that they're not alone. They're not isolated. We have very similar experiences and we can, we can uh, grow with support of each other. Um, and I think you're right. You know, you talk about the physical ergonomics, but, you know, cognitive ergonomics is a huge problem. You know, there's the amount that we have to grapple and manage on a daily basis of complex tasks. And, you know, I think from an organizational standpoint, we need to go and kind of clean house and say, not just add expectations, but start to remove them. Uh, you know, a self-care thing that would fit well with that would be to say, hey, um, as an individual, these are the these are the tasks that I do not feel are compassionate and that and that get in my way. And I would love an organization that would say, "Hey, well, let's look at maybe changing or getting rid of those." So I think it's got to be bi-directional for um, on an organizational level. I mean, I, I I do yoga, I meditate, I do a lot of things, I walk, you know, and I, things that are very valuable to me. But on an organizational level, you start to say, "Well, let's change culture. Well, let's grow the culture." It's got to be a bi-directional support. It's got to be. Um, self-care and organizational care, and they go together and build something bigger than just the individual. That I think would be meaningful. You know, when I when I deal with an organization and I feel like I hit a wall, um, it's very discouraging um, because I feel like, you know, the espoused and enacted values are often very different. Um, you know, when they use marketing as kind of and gimmickry to kind of show how wonderfully they're doing, meanwhile, they're treating people badly. You know, that's kind of hard to throw self-care in uh as a as a um us to solve that problem because it's it's not going to work that's the part that's not going to work not the self care so thank you so much i'm going to i'm just going to jump in um real quick here because i think what we are talking about and what we're we're discovering is that we're now we are now able to evidence that care, by by introducing caring science into a hospital system or nursing school as a professional practice model. We're now showing that it can reduce uh, turnover, staff turnover, which is a huge financial burden. And it also improves the patient's perception of caring. And the reason why I'm talking about this, we have um, these um, Caritas measures where it's, Jean Watson talks about having it being an, a full circle of knowledge. So that we're not just, you know, what are we evident, what are we evidencing and how are we evidencing? And I think that's something that we need to transform our healthcare systems because we're moving away from that empiricism, that empirical model to, to the humanistic model. So that actually, especially from the pandemic, caring for a patient when their family were not able to even be in the room, having someone hold their hand at the bedside we all suddenly saw how valuable and important it is. And so rather than that training of technical training, not incorporating literacy into caring is, is not valuable. So I think what we need to talk about too, is as you say, you know, that all of us as professionals to be able to, to be literate in the value of caring in the boardrooms, in talking to the finance team so that they get it, you know, we to speak that language, hey, if you utilize this work, it's actually going to improve the financial cost. Right. It's not about why they do it. It's about moving this work forward in an authentic way so that we can actually care for ourselves, others and the planet. Um, so th I think that's a really good point. And um, it might be a, a good um, uh, resource for you, Natalia, in your research about care, caring measures. We're working with data companies called Prescani, Qualtrics, on how adding these questions into the patient scores. It's still an add-on, but it's about the questions are, were you treated with loving kindness? Were your needs met with dignity? Did you experiencing a caring moment? So those are very different questions to, to the regular ones of how quickly did your call button get turned off? So, you know, what are we, what's important to us and, and, and how can we show that and evidence that? So thank I, you so much. I, I dare you could ask those same questions of the employees. I don't think that they would, 
I don't think that they would be asked or or welcomed, but mm -hmm. I think you would find um, not as rosy a picture as what the um, patients, you know, and it, and it's a, the um, the model in from my standpoint of the surgical ergonomics is really telling that you know every individual iterative patient care is properly and valued and carefully uh, scrutinized. But what is the impact of taking of doing a thousand of those surgeries on the people who are doing them? And that's not evaluated, but that has to be a part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Same thing with taking care of patients, you know, um, yes, the individual, what are they cared for, but what about the people who are, do who are providing the care? Right. And how do we, as you say, care, you know, how do we create that caring and healing environment? It's not just focusing on the patient. Mm -hmm. If you're happy with your colleagues, if you have, you know, the, if, if it's a, as Cheryl talks about a biocidic toxic environment, it's totally not going to work because right. you need to feel safe. You need to feel loved yourself. You need to feel valued in the organization. And so these are the other, you know, we have organizational care, uh, caring questions as well as self uh, colleague leadership um, questions as well. So you're absolutely right. It has to be a full circle of, um, of, in, of, of not of acknowledgement of, of of stepping into this new way of living and being, I think. And the thing that's happening um, is people are leaving. You know, they can't. They don't feel like they can change the culture. And then, and then you look and you have the last person standing. You know, which is you know that can't work either, right? You know, oh, I'm going to take all the burden myself. Well, that's that's a recipe for failure. No, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I know that we've gone a little uh, gone a little bit over time, but it was just such an engaging conversation. Thank you so much. If there's any other questions other than Carol, I'll just hand back over to Carol and, and I'll be quiet now. So thank you all so much. It's so beautiful to see everyone here. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, comment that, you know, you're talking here about changing the culture and you have, you know, started medical care in countries that people could never have, you know, experienced. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, you're talking about self-care and that spiritual change in our thinking. But what I, I really loved about your book was the, uh, the very practical things that you listed in one portion of your book that, um, I mean, I, you know, I, my career was in the trenches. I was bedside. And those uh, ideas that you brought forth, I thought were, were just, uh, you know, so helpful as, mm -hmm. as a nurse to be able to say, like one of them was to, uh, and it won't, won't help everybody. I realize that, but to be able to tell a family member, why don't you bring in pictures like your sister did? Right. You know, uh, it's a simple thing that would give me as a, you know, somebody working with a dying patient, something to say to the family, this may comfort that person. Right the music you could go on you wrote you wrote the chapter <laughs> well the thing the thing is you know Compare that it's very you, practical well there there's so many ways that we can look at making our human humanizing the environment of the hospital and you know you bring in pictures of family members that was hugely important for my sister you know if, so if people say well that's not really doable well then you can bring bring in a flash drive of photos and play them on a monitor or you know you can play music that people want to hear and there's so many um simple things that would be really helpful for people um you know so yeah i i thank you for mentioning that and um i just look and i go the, i look at the environment and say there's so many ways that we could make it a more pleasant experience and that would have a great deal of impact on patients and families and we don't do that but we should the, the, the music playlist the and the and the bit with all the all the um, beepers that mm -hmm. go on that right. you, you said why can't that IV be going off with a beeper just go right to the nurse's phone? I right. mean these things should be possible today. It's 2024. <laughs> it should be it should be possible. Well, I'm glad you like those things because I think that if you just look and say um, how how do we look at the care we're providing and 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 making the environment better and there's just a, a bunch of simple ways that it would have a big impact i mean my sister was woken up you know they wake wake her up at 5 a.m and say how are you feeling it was like well i was sleeping you know you know is that really necessary you know eight months into the hospital stay you know so there's lots of ways of doing it 
I love the I love that that uh, portion of the book, and I recommend that nurses read that book. I think it was, I love the practical part of it and just the humanness that you brought forth. Well, it, it's uh, interesting. Thank you, and it's I'll just say that um, my agent said because I made the pitch of this book, and she said, "Well, no one wants to read a memoir. The only way they're going to want to read it is if it's um, prescriptive nonfiction. If you say take your experience and what you went through, and then." how to do things better and differently. So that's what I tried to do. It's like, what, what are the things we can learn? And that we're all, and, and my sister's story is not unique. It, the point is it's, it's common. This is, everyone goes through these things. So how do we learn from each other and how do we learn from our, our tragedies and our, our losses and how do we improve the world we have? Yeah. Well, I, I, I did appreciate the book and I sent your thoughts from that that chapter to the American Nurses Association in this area and to the That's Holistic right, Care right. Council at ANOVA. So <laughs> I just thought they were fantastic. Thanks. And I, I know we have to close. Um, is there anyone else that uh, had any, any ending comment? All right. Well, mm. oh, my name is Shonda Harrison and I just recently experienced uh, uh, eight weeks of my son being in a trauma center because of a horrific accident. And I just want to say I really appreciate it because we witnessed a lot of the um, the same scenarios that were explained, I mean, that were shared today. But I think we'd be dialoguing one with another, telling everybody has a story and you don't know how your story will impact another one, but alleviating the fear of sharing it, of shame or whatever needs to, you know, needs to be out the window so that one by one we can share our stories and maybe we would change that one person that could change another person in sharing. Because I've, I just witnessed dialoguing with the nurses about the care and and um, sharing compassionate stories, I it just in the hallway you could see things just lifted from people just sharing your own story. So I think we need to just be a little bit freer with just sharing our stories and creating compassion as we walk through the journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's healing. Is very healing. It is. It is. Well, I think we I think we're come to closure here. I know we're over time. And uh, let's see, I think we had, uh, Dr. Jennifer, do you have something to close with this afternoon? I do not. I thought that was Lauren. <laughs> was that Lauren that you, I don't know. Maybe I'm mistaken. I did not plan. Okay. Okay. Well, who else would, who would like to volunteer? I mean, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot. You're all Caritas um, oriented and who would like to volunteer to bring us to closure? Uh, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm happy. Oh, Lauren, are you happy to do that? Thank you. You're, it'd be perfect for you. To okay. Um, so it was a very interesting uh, conversation. And uh, let's close our eyes, nice deep breaths, and know that if we bring forth to the bedside and hallways of our institutions, compassionate, loving care, and be the example, it does eventually reflect, you'll see the change happening. Be the change you want to see, as you had said in the beginning of this. Nice deep breaths. Thank you for joining us. It was a very emotional for me as well for, you know, being the patient, you have a whole different insight. I always say I'm going to write a book called The Other Side of the Bed. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Everyone have a good day. You too, Thank you, Dr. Stern. Thank you for coming. 
and we'll see you next month. It's a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Stern. Very much. Good luck at Michigan, one of my alma maters. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies, Carol. I thought that Lauren was doing the latter half because other people wanted to speak. So I'm so sorry. That's all right. I, There's always somebody to jump in.